Hello, I'm Rob Zinkov, and I'm going to give you a tour over some model te checking techniques that you can use with PyMC3, and generically. So let's just uh, set the uh, let's just set the ground uh, here. So if you sort of follow the quick start and a lot of the other guides in PyMC3, you're probably pretty good at fitting models. Um, and, you know, maybe plotting them, and you've probably made some nice trace plots. Um, and there's, most of the questions seem to fall in that, that regard. But you've probably spent less time thinking about, is, the, is your model any good? Like, not, not is it right or is it wrong, but like like is it useful? Can like are you gonna be able to use it for something? Um, do, like is it gonna like help you out? And there's when you kind of ask for guidelines on that regard, the advice gets a lot less sharp, and you start getting a lot more inconsistent answers. So the goal of this talk is to give you some, um, sh give you a flavor of some of the things you can do and also kind of give you more confidence about how you're going to go about doing them. So there are a lot of methods. Um, controversially, I suppose, I'm going to cover methods that are both Bayesian and frequentist, um, particularly because I think for model checking uh, and model comparison, uh, this is sort of the workplace where I think the frequencies method still can make some sense. Um, even if your model is Bayesian, I think you'll find that there are some ways to make use of some of these techniques. Uh, they'll still be pretty handy. Um, so there's sort of two things people are saying. So, you know, I'm saying model checking, I'm saying model selection, I'm saying model comparison. Um, these are sometimes referred to in uh, separately, uh, which is they, when people talk about model evaluation, they're saying, is my model of the data any good? Yes or no? This is very almost like a kind of a hypothesis testish thing to say, um, which is, is your data any good? Um, just yes or no. Um, do I need to go and fix up my model uh, to make it work for me better? And then there's this notion of model selection, which is I have a bunch of ways I can sort of improve my model, which is the one I should go with. And these are distinct questions. These are separate questions. But I sometimes think it's kind of helpful to sort of think of them all as sort of all in the same sort of um, framework. Because, you know, in some sense, if you collect enough data, um, your model's not gonna be up to stuff um, for any of them. So in some sense, even when you do model version, you'll be, you'll think about, well, okay, of all the PyMC3 models I could have made, um, which of them seems to be doing the best um, because none of them will ever sort of adequately describe the data if you have enough data. Um, so I think it's worth kind of thinking about it with both of these. Um, for a context of like this talk, the whole bait, the whole uh, way of going through a workflow, I'm not covering all of this. So for those that don't know, this is, uh, this is a figure from Michael Betancourt's Bayesian workflow case study. Um, and for the most part, we're going to be kind of just concentrating over here. Um, we're going to assume that all these methods here are things that you're going to try out after you fit your model, and then maybe you'll go back and then tweak your model again, and you'll sort of go over and over again. Um, and... Going along with that, the assumption I'm making is, you know, you can run and fit a few uh, a few models in PyMC3. Um, I'm going to try to cover a lot, but I'm obviously not going to cover 
all the different goodness of Fitess is sort of the other way these are sometimes called, um, which is just is your how good of a fit your model is uh, to the data. Um, and even among the stuff I'm going to cover, not all of it is in PyMC3, and it's not even clear all of it should be in PyMC3. Um, but it is, I sort of included to give you a taste of sort of what's out there. The, um, the models we're going to be looking at um, are ones for testing uh, radon in a house. So for those who are unfamiliar with this lovely data set, um, he, it's motivated by this problem that many researchers, including Andrew Gelman and others, have worked on, which is that radon is this odorless, colorless gas that... Um, if you have uh, that can cause lung cancer, it tends to leach into a house through the groundwater and makes its way up through the soil. So things like basements tend to have more of it. Um, and the EPA conducted this whole study to try to figure out roughly how like what predicts whether a house is likely to have it. Um, there are of course very regional properties associated with it, so. Certain counties, certain geographical regions are more likely to have it. Um, and of course, a nice high Bayesian model was used to predict radon levels based on a bunch of these properties. Um, and it's pretty well known. Um, and so because of that, um, and through various sort of shared culture, it's one of the standard data sets that'll just come with PyMC3. So just so you don't have to dig around, this something, this is data that you should, if you have PyMC3 installed, you have this data set installed. Um, so we're just gonna do, just gonna do a little bit of a cleaning. This is just a clean up to get everything into the right format. Um, so, for all of our examples, we're essentially trying to predict how much radon is in a house in Minnesota based on whether we're doing this measurement of the basement or the ground level and what county it is. Uh, we're going to be mostly predicting against log radon uh, because that kind of has a nice, like, almost normal distribution. So we'll just uh, simplify uh, our prediction, uh, our models. And we're gonna have three models we're gonna compare with. The first model is the pooled model. This is one where we don't really take into account county information. Um, and we're largely just gonna basically be predicting based on, um, are we in the basement? Uh, is this a measurement from the basement or uh, a measurement from the ground level, and we're going to just sort of have this global parameter alpha that just covers generally sort of the global county effect. Um, the second model is no pooling. This is one where we, we're going to introduce a variable for every single county in Minnesota, all 85 of them. And then, of course, uh, these are sort of like the two extremes. You know, one is, you know, we we fit parameter for every county. One is we have a parameter that's sort of the average of the counties. And then there's this Goldilocks one, uh, which is uh, partially pooled, which is um, we're going to have a parameter for each county, but we're going to say that we're going to sort of share data. We're going to sort of share across them. So we're going to say that all of these values have to be somewhat near each other. So this, this in some sense kind of gives the best of both worlds. Um, and so the point with all these exercises is that this is the model that generally should perform the best and we're gonna watch it do, we're gonna watch it do that in, in a bunch of different ways, which should also kind of give you confidence um, in these different model checking techniques. Uh, because in some sense, it's reassuring when they agree with each other. Um, so what's the first way we can evaluate models? Predictive accuracy. 
if there's actually a thing you're trying to measure, um, I think it's just the best way. I think it's just the best way to evaluate the models. We're trying to predict radon levels. Um, if we can just sort of nail that, if we can sort of successfully predict it, um, that's better than almost any sort of game we're going to play with, like, likelihoods and things like that. Um, so it's worth thinking about, like, if there is actually a task that you're, like, fitting models in PyMC3 for, you know, the, the re a reason you went for it, um, having some sort of particular task that you're trying to do well on will, will often be sort of your best bet. Um, so... We're gonna, we can just treat this like a machine learning problem. We're going to take some of our radon levels, set, set a few aside, and see if we can predict the radon levels for unseen data. So just going to, so we can just take our data, split it up into uh, our in-sample and out-of-sample. Then we, just fit, we can just fit with our in-sample data for our pooled model or unpooled model and our partially pooled model. Um, and then because these ra this radon level is a continuous value, we can just use some, um, we can use root mean squared error, which work just fine. So what we're just gonna do is after we fit this model, we can essentially just um, take our, um, we can say so we're taking our average parameters. So basically like we're just going to average over every, every parameter in the trace. And using that average, we can then take our prediction. It's our average prediction across all the parameters and compare it to the true value. And, um, if we're if we do really well, this should uh, go. Uh, this should be close to zero. Basically, zero means we did perfectly. Numbers higher than zero means we did less well. So here's a simple implementation uh, for how you might calculate this. Um, so so let's just go ahead and do that. So I'll just go slowly for one of the models, and then I'll kind of go quickly for the others. So basically we're going to take our out of sample data. We're going to get a posterior predictive. Basically, we're just going to take samples. We're going to take new samples of this data that we want to predict uh, for radon. And then what we're going to do is we're going to just take the average value from just sampling from the posterior predictive and compare that to the actual value. Um, so we get 0.8996 here, which we don't, we don't know if that's good or not, uh, but let's compare it to the other models we have. So for unpooled value, for, un, for the unpooled value, uh, we get 0.92, so that's a little worse. And then for the partially pooled value, we get 0.845. So the sort of the fanciest model seems to be doing a better job recovering the actual radon levels. Um, so for this example, it was just a continuous thing. But in principle, this can work with anything you're trying to predict. Of course, if it's discrete data, uh, you might use something like Hamming distance, um, if it's something like, say, search results, you maybe might use some sort of rank distance. Uh, the idea here is, of course, any, essentially any arbitrary um, discrep um, ever, any arbitrary scoring function can go here. Um, it'll work just fine. Um, one thing we can do to be fancier is we could have. Um, not, so you know, we just sort of took the expectation here but we could have just returned all the draws and then we could have done some sort of scoring function that, um, you know, takes the probability associated with the values into account. This is all, this all falls under things we can sort of do with the predictive accuracy. Um, 
So one thing to maybe check out if you're sort of interested particularly in scoring that takes into account prior probability, look for things that are like Briar scores. Uh, there's a cool paper from Adrian Rafferty that sort of talks about some of this stuff. Um, so beyond that, there's, of course, cross-validation. Cross-validation is essentially just like is, is us just sort of doing this data split several times. So we just split once and saw how we did. In principle, you can just split, do the test, do another split, do the valuation, average across them. And this might be a little bit more stable. This is effectively just what it means to do cross-validation. I don't have any uh, just code to do this, but it's pretty... Um, a good exercise might be to implement cross-validation, given what you've seen. All right. So suppose you don't really have, like, a task in mind, you know. So if there's no real way to compare the data, you can always just say, like, is the data I generate something that the model is the data generated, can I at least hold out data and say that this is data that like the model believes is likely? So the idea here is now we're not going to say like, okay, is this value close to this value? We're just going to say, is this held out value something that um, the model wouldn't find unreasonable to generate? Um, so... So, since we're doing likelihood, we can just grab, we're just going to grab some point estimate. Uh, I'm just going to grab maximum posteriori here for convenience. Um, the maximum posteriori and, you know, point estimates are always a little bit finicky. So it actually, actually had a bit of a rough time uh, getting it from uh, our partially pulled model. So I just grabbed the point, I just grabbed the point arbitrarily. Um, Hopefully it shouldn't matter too much. Um, so the idea there is we can now just grab, we can just grab the probability of these from point estimates and for actual data. And lo and behold, um, under uh, the fanciest model, data seems the most likely. Uh, this is a thing you can, so these, this sort of just, Likelihood on held out data, this is a thing you can do even in a frequent, this is a frequentist method. Um, and it's still one that sort of um, can be used to sort of compare models um, as well. No, when I say frequentist method, this doesn't mean, this isn't implying hypothesis, it just means we're not being Bayesian, we're not trying to marginalize over our parameters. We're, you know, we just took a point estimate, plugged it in, and just did a quick comparison of these likelihoods. If you want something that's more vision, you might do a marginal likelihood, where you know we sort of um, average over our parameters, um, and that's something you can do. So we can go ahead and. Using sample SMC, we can get a marginal likelihood estimate. Um, so marginal likelihood, it's just it's just the probability estimate where we've averaged out uh, our parameters. So we can do that. We can get those, um, and um, we can see here that when you sort of go across all the different parameters, um, partially pulled is still the most likely, but it's maybe a little closer now. Um, these can be um, these can be a little expensive to compute, but if you're in a setting where they're not, what people will often do is uh, they'll make something called a Bayes factor. The idea with the base factor is 
if I have these these two models and I actually kind of want to pick between the two of them and not just score them, um, how might I do that? So one thing I can do is I can take their ratio and for various nice algebraic reasons, uh, I actually don't need the posteriors. I can actually get away with just the likelihood. Um, and this just requires to have a probability on each of these models. If we assume we have two models and we assume each is equally likely, this, this term will just go away. Um, and then we could just take this ratio. And intuitively, with the ratio, this number is higher the, the, more, uh, the more we want to prefer M0 over M1. And it's, um, and basically the, the larger the ratio, the more confident we can be. Uh, and this ends up being a bit of, um, and of course in our situation with part, um, this ends up being sort of silly overkill. Um, but base factors are, are a bit, um, they're a bit of a peculiar thing because you, they're designed to sort of fake almost this, uh, almost like a hypothesis test. Cause like, you know, it, it comes from this need to have this like yes or no answer of like, oh, is this better? Oh yeah, this is so much better. You know, this is an obscene amount better, but mm, it's it's still kind of limited because it's hard to figure out how to kind of make it work when you have like n models you're considering, and it really is something that's like oh it's not you have when you have a discrete set of models maybe it kind of makes sense. Also because of how it works with likelihood, it can end up being like not very stable. So little changes in your model can completely break base factors. Um, maybe. You, I hope I haven't offended anyone who uses and loves base factors, but this is, they have been, they've always felt to me a bit of a brittle uh, piece of machinery. So what are, what are some other uh, ways we can evaluate our models? If you've used PyMC3 for a bit, post prior and posterior predictive checks have probably been the most common way you've evaluated models. Um, it's what's built in, it's generally what's most accessible, um, and it seems to be what most people are pretty comfortable using. Um, the idea of prior predictive checks is, um, before you even fit your data, if your prior is reasonable, it should kind of look, it should kind of look like your data. like. Your first guess of what um, your data, like your prior, should be kind of informative, uh, because if they're not, like, wh why are you, why are you doing Bayesian inference? Um, you should be using, um, you should be, you know, do, getting some point estimate or something. Um, and so you can see here, eh, is this prior good? I don't know. It feels a little bit dispersed. Um, and the story is similar for the other models, so I'm not gonna show them. Uh, and this could be, and this is built into RVs. Can be done. Pose your post your predictive checks. Same story, but now we fit our model to our data, and now we're gonna try to. What we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to generate our. We're gonna try to generate our data. Now that our now that our primers have been fit to that data, so this should be a little bit of a tighter fit. So we can see here for the pooled model, um, we can see our observed data. All these turquoise lines that you can see they're sort of faint is essentially we've create we've sort of sampled. Uh, our data set and 
So this is doing multiple, and so if we're sort of on the right track, the mean or in general some sort of summary statistic of our data sets should look a lot like our observed data set. And we can see it sort of does for the pooled model. We see it doesn't quite for the unpooled model. And then for the partially pooled model, it also looks pretty good. Um, generally when people, what's kind of interesting is when people think of posterior predictive checks, they are seen as this thing you plot, this thing that's done visually. Um, but in principle, uh, and in particular, if you go and invent, like go and interrogate what gets produced when you call sample posterior predictive, you can have you can use any discrepancy measure. You can take any discrepancy measure um, and apply it to your data and compare it to these different draws of your data. Um, and again, this is another place where if you have a task-specific discrepancy, um, it's worth using. So because we we're sort of just using distances for radon levels, I think the visual works okay. But you can, um, but you can also just explicitly plot that. Um, but in terms of if you just want numbers, um, and we haven't really done too much of this, but you know, in some sense, if you had a chart and you had to sort of rank how well all your different models did, you might want some number. Um, so that's just the goal here. The goal here is just to get a number that we can use to score our models. So, and then, you know, because at the end of the day, maybe we just decide that we're going to pick the one with the best score. Um, so what are the different ones there? One of the earliest that was made is the AIC. This is very much as you're going to just, just see just just trade off between your maximum likelihood and just the number of parameters you have uh, t times two. So if uh, your data is very likely under the point estimate, that's pretty good. Um, there's nothing Bayesian about this. This is like this, you could have done, for example, this is a point estimate. Um, done for maximum likelihood. Interestingly enough, Bayesian information criterion is also not Bayesian. Uh, you know, you can just file this under a bunch of things that have the word Bayesian in them that actually aren't Bayesian. Uh, I actually even forgot to change this A into B. It's literally just AIC, but there, now there's this lo log n term for the data. Um, it's not clear what the hell it's supposed to do. I mean, like, it's not even clear what's going on because it's trading off the amount of data you have against the likelihood of it. Because presumably if like you have a lot of data, this just goes to zero. It doesn't really make sense to me, but it's out there and like people will ask about it. Um, the... If you actually want something that's kind, if you want something that's like AIC but a little more Bayesian, um, the better thing might be to go with uh, this uh, deviance information criterion. Um, so the idea here is that we're going to sort of trade off between two quantities. Um, one is this quantity here, which is just Given sort of given say um, an expected an um, an average value for our parameters, sort of you know, you know, an expectation over it. Um, how well is the data explained versus just on average? How are um, how how well do we sort of do? Uh, for every parameter, just sort of on average, how well do we do for each of them? So this is, it's almost sort of like this sort of the point estimate 
kind of uh, transferred against sort of this uh, average across um, for the different parameters. Um, you can sometimes also see it as um, almost like a mean variance trade-off. Um, it's a bit unstable. This actually used to be in PyMC3, but I think it just crashed a bunch and no one was convinced they had it implemented correctly. So it was just removed. Um, what instead is in PyMC3 these days is the widely available information criterion. Um, and this is essentially, the intention of this is to take DIC and just make it actually Bayesian um, and also sort of be more explicit about kind of a lot of what DIC was already doing. Um, so the better the way to sort of think about this one is that it's this trade-off between the log expectation of the data with respect to the parameters um, trading off against the variance of this lo um, log of p given uh, given the data. And so with this one, you see there's no more point estimates. Um, theta is always being marginalized out um, for everything that's done. So you know, both, both, the, both this E and V are over theta given Y. Uh, actually, just to be clear, same thing here. This Both of these expectations are with respect to uh, P of theta given Y. Um, so this is a properly vision criteria and it's actually fairly stable. Um, and if we run it, I don't know, this might be seen, might be a little bit small. Um, you can see that it, uh, it's, um, does fairly, um, picks out the best model fairly well. Also in PyMC3 is this leave one out cross validation criterion. The idea with this one is much more in the spirit of um, the early earlier thing, which is that, you know, sort of the best way to know how well we're doing is just to have held out data. So what this does is, you take your data set, remove one of the data set points, fit your model on the rest of the data, evaluate how you did uh, on this held out data, just, you know, how likely are you to, um, how likely sort of the probability of uh, generating it, block probability, and then repeat this over and over again and, and take the average. Um, This also works really well, and um, yeah, in some ways, um, weight can be sort of seen, and others can be seen as a, pro a fast approximation of Lou. Uh, this is something we just have to like play with the algebra um, in the terms to sort of see them that way. But yeah, one interesting thing with Wake in particular is if you act Wake gives you this cool thing for free uh, if you have it implemented, which are these posterior dispersion indices. So this is just an implementation I've just put inside this notebook. So when you download this notebook, you'll just have it. Uh, it's basically just a cobbled together version of the wake implementation where I've just shuffled some things around. Uh, but the key thing is that if you take the variance per data point and don't sum them up, um, to, you know, take the variance and divide it by the expectation, you get this sort of signal to noise ratio for each of your data points. And intuitively, what this lets you do is it lets you identify data points that are a bit that are outliers. So if we run this um, on our data, 
we can and ask just sort of what are the most odd points we get these and um and so we can see here you can see these so these are a lot, what you can see here is they're ones where radon levels really low or really high and you know particularly if we drill down on carver county we'll see that you know this is way lower than anything being experienced there so sort of caught its eye you know something's going on here this is really good for debugging for sort of building your models up it's very useful to sort of see what data does your model find surprising and try to understand what like is that a systemic thing that you have to model or is that just something interesting something weird about the data itself um, it's it's just a very handy thing to uh, have. Um, so that's a posterior prediction. Is um, there are actually are also a bunch of tests you can do that are just if you just have samples. If you don't even have like if you can't compute the likelihoods, you just have a pile of sample from your model and the data. Um, so the motivation with these is if we have some data P and we have some model Q, uh, that, that, you know, we get examples from, how can we tell if they're sort of from different data sets? So, you know, we can ask, is, are these from two different data sets, uh, P and Q say, yeah, probably are these two data sets uh from different distributions uh, that's a little less clear so the intuition that you may had is that there's um data from dis data you can consider that you have data from different distributions if you can construct a function that essentially separates them um, in particular can you make a function can you make a can you make a can you find a function that makes this quantity really big? Um, and so, and what's kind of cool is if you pick your class of functions well, like say the unit ball in the reproducing Hilbert space, um, they're a nice close form solution to find the optimal answer here. I won't go into how this class of functions, how to find this optimal answer. Oh, um, only, only just to say that um, they exist and um, there's a lie. Um, I've included some code in this notebook to sort of play around a bit. So the intuition is if you can really um if you have samples that are both from the same distribution, you're never going to find a great function. And the best function you find to separate them apart just isn't going to be able to do the job. And most of the time, um, it'll just be near zero. While if you actually do kind of pull it off, there'll be some value that you're able to kind of pull them apart from. So you can make a whole statistical test for this. Uh, so I've included some code to do this. Uh, and this just toy example, um, the, you know, this sort of like almost like kind of bonus. Um, so, you know, if I generate data from a normal one, data from normal negative three, uh, it's pretty good at um, saying, okay, these are like not the same data. Um, and, you know, it'll still work pretty well. Um, e even for even when, for, when they're fairly cl close apart together. So, but what's really cool about this method is you can take your true model and two models that are really close to it um, and then say, which one should you prefer? Should you prefer model one or model two? And even being really close, it can detect that, oh, yeah, model two is what you want. Um, behind the scenes, what effectively this is just doing is you compare model one to the true to the true model. 
you compare model two to true model and sort of whichever ones, and then you sort of subtract these two distances and that tells you, you know, whether that's a positive or negative number, that sort of tells you which one you ought to prefer. Um, there's sort of even, um, and there's sort of fancier ways to do this. So one of the other ways is um, when you're sort of looking for this function in terms of finding, you know, suppose, you know, I didn't want to like have to generate samples. Suppose I just wanted to take my data and just like keep the density for my model. So if you're pretty intelligent with how you pick uh, this operation here, you could essentially make a function that when you maximize, uh, in particular, if you make this function for, again, picking a good reproducing kernel Hilbert space, you can get also, you can find something that separates out data even better. And there's some nice things with like learning kernels where you can really make this work pretty, uh, almost generically. Um, and this one again, like for really small dis so I've sort of hacked something where I can, you know, throw in a PyMC models, um, for fairly, this is only going to work for continuous, uh, models at the moment, but this can really detect small differences, um, between the true model and, um, all you have. So if I go ahead and let's say 0.45, let that run a little bit. And yeah, and, and it can detect uh, that these are different. My, my, yeah. So really fine dis uh, differences it can detect. So and one of the nice things is, what does it mean to detect fine distances? Um, it's about detecting, uh, you can also, when you're sort of looking at this function to maximize the distance, you can just ask, where is this, where do these two data sets sort of differ the most? Uh, and that ends up having a feature that's very similar to the posterior dispersion indices, which helps us identify data that's badly exp uh, explained by the model. So the context of this image is we have some crime data from Chicago. Um, we're, we're trying to predict where crime happens. If you use a mixture of two Gaussians to predict where crime happens, say just two hotspots, uh, because they're spherical Gaussians, they don't do very well with the fact that Chicago borders Lake Michigan uh, and crimes don't happen out in the middle of a lake very often. So, but this is a feature that's, again, this is sort of, you know, similar theme to what we uh, talked about before, but same sort of thing. Uh, the, the big advantage of these methods over the previous one I talked about is they, if you sort of pick your kernels correctly, if you sort of learn uh, them properly, these are, these can detect very, very small differences in data. So if you're, if you're trying to figure, if you think you're close, like if you think you have a model that's close, this can be really good to help you identify what you need to really get the model correct if you're in a setting where that matters. So, okay, I've thrown a bunch of things at you and it might be worth just sort of summarize like what you should do. Okay, so I just, essentially, this is just sort of the talk as a flow chart. So you can sort of come away with this and go with that. So what should you, so how should you evaluate your model? First things first, if you have downstream task, you should evaluate that. Oh, um, if you have a lot of data, you can also sort of do some stuff with cross validation, you know, maybe some held out likelihood. If you just want a number you can rank things on, Wake and Lou, they're built into PyMC3, just use them. 
Um, and if you're starting to kind of get to that final, if you're trying to start to identify, like, if something's off, um, start checking out posterior dispersion indices. Um, or, you know, if you just kind of are trying to get more of a feel for it, posterior predictive checks. Um, for comparing models, if you are in a setting where you have just two discrete models, base factor works. Also, if you're if the models you're comparing are like really similar and you're really trying to sort of get a sense of which is better, and it's hard to say, relative MMD or kernel size discrepancy could get you there. But otherwise, you could just score the mo you can just score your models using all the model checking techniques we talked about and just pick the one with the higher score. You know, if you're gonna be like if you're gonna just measure predictive accuracy, you can just then go pick the model with the highest predictive accuracy. Thank you for listening to my talk and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.